conference on Zoom. And as you see, things um, are not that easy as they are normal when we are living in, uh, when we are meeting in, in real life. So in fact, what we had to do in this situation is to move our whole uh, semester program online. Now, my name is Sabine Weiland. I'm the director of ESPOR Lab of the ESPOR Lab Research Center for European and International Politics. For those who watch us from the outside, ESPOL is the European School of Political and Social Sciences at the Catholic University Lille in um, the north of France. Um, if you're interested to learn more about the research center and um, about our school, so please um, have a look at our website. Now, coming to today's conference, uh, we are very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Michael Holmes, who will give a presentation titled Conflict and Cooperation Politics in the Time of COVID-19. But before that, I would like to introduce um, our speaker, uh, Michael Holmes is Associate Professor at ESPOL. He actually joined the school as a permanent faculty member only this uh, semester. Uh, Michael is also the director of the Lille Liverpool European Institute at the Catholic University. And before um, he came to Lille, Michael was a senior lecturer in Liverpool Hope University. In his research, Michael focuses mainly on Ireland and on the EU in particular on the impact of European integration on political parties. He has published extensively on um, left-wing parties um, in the European Union. Among others, he um, edited, co-edited the volume The European Left and the Financial Crisis um, with Knut Roda from 2019, and also the volume From Larkin to Lisbon, The Left and the European Constitution also co-edited with Knut Roder from 2012. In this presentation today, uh, Michael addresses the politics of COVID-19. So this is a very uh, timely or maybe the uh, timely topic. Um, before I would like to give the word to Michael, I would also like to introduce um, my dear colleague, Oriane Caligaro. She is a pr associate professor at ESPO as well. So Oriane and myself, we will both uh, discuss the presentation of Michael, ask some questions, and uh, we will then hopefully um, have an interesting conversation together. Now, I would like to give the floor to Michael. Happy to have you here, and we look forward to your presentation. Please. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I'm going to be setting up my screen, just one moment. It's not a good start. Okay, um, I'm ready to go with my screen ready. Uh, so thank you very much, Sabine, and thank you in advance, Oriane. I trust there will be no very difficult questions from you. And to everybody else, um, hello, bonjour, and dear, dear Greta as well. So uh, uh, in multiple languages, it's a great pleasure uh, to be giving my first talk here as a uh, a member of the, a full member of the ESPOL team. Um, uh, again, with the introduction, you'll see that this is taking me outside my comfort zone. Um, I'm very happy talking about uh, Irish political parties, the left in Europe, and so on. I'm not going to be mentioning virtually any of that as I go through today's session. So it is a little bit different, uh, and it's a very speculative piece. I suppose I should be saying the best way, what I should have been doing for the last month or so, is to be traveling all around Europe conducting face to face research. But obviously, given the topic we're looking at, that's pretty impossible at the moment. Um, so this is, as I say, a speculative piece, uh, looking at uh, the themes and uh, examining some of the issues around the politics uh, of COVID-19. The structure of what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to start out with some loose definitions uh, of the framework of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to say a little bit about how to win a crisis uh, and how uh, politically that can be achieved or sought, at very least. Uh, I'm then going to look at some examples of cooperation and of conflict that have emerged during the course of the, uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, and I'm going to use that to test three approaches, which I will have identified when I talk about that section about how to win a crisis. So three uh, ideas of how we go about dealing with 
uh, a crisis uh, in terms of what I'm going to, try to, uh, going to try to do. And at the end, I'm going to be extremely foolish uh, and I'm going to try to make some predictions. Um, uh, so please, before I get there, please do switch off uh, before that particular section. Uh, and certainly don't note them down because I'm sure they'll all be wrong. Uh, but that's the basic framework of what I'm going to try to get through uh, over the next short period of time. Okay. So with that structure in mind, let's start thinking a little bit about some of the um, definitional elements, what exactly we're talking about. Uh, particularly, um, I, I found this interesting just going back to try to sort of put together the pieces of thinking about uh, a definition of COVID-19, um, of what we're talking about, a corona type virus that causes very severe uh, respiratory illness in some people, not in everybody, so we get all these diverse types of cases. Uh, a timeline, very first reports were about an unidentified illness coming in from Wuhan uh, in December of last year. It was identified as a novel form of coronavirus by the 11th of January. Um, by the 30th of January, it was being declared a public health emergency by the World Health Organization, uh, and it was declared a pandemic in March of this year. Uh, and as of the 19th of September, we have over 30 million cases recorded and closing in on a million deaths uh, from uh, the COVID situation. Um, so that's the context, as we all know. Um, uh, a couple of other definitional elements I want to look at. Um, what I'm going to focus on when I talk, think about the political aspect of this. Okay, there's one definition of politics, that the politics is the activity by which decisions are made and implemented for a community. So I'm going to be focusing in on here, okay, how has COVID-19 affected decision-making structures and also particularly our sense of community? And I think that's a very important part. Communities don't just exist, they are shaped and constructed uh, by uh, our own social interactions. And if, if we've learned anything over the last six, seven, eight months, COVID has disrupted our social interactions. So that is going to have an impact on our political relations as well as everything else. Um, so I'm going to try to explore some of that. If we think as well about a crisis, um, uh, we can uh, obviously there's the kind of a broad idea of it's a difficult or dangerous situation, but also one in which uh, an important decision, uh, a point of making a choice is open. Uh, and I think that's a very important part of considering crisis in this context. It opens, uh, there is a supposed idea that crisis is made up of the words um, uh, a danger and an opportunity in Chinese. As far as I know, this is, I've checked this, I've done a lot of work on the word crisis, that doesn't actually uh, uh, apply. Um, however, it does give us, give us this idea that crises are dangerous, but also openings for new approaches and new ideas. And I think that's what makes it interesting. So we have a basic idea of what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, so let's go on a little bit further to try and think uh, about um, uh, what uh, different ways of approaching uh, a crisis in this context. And I've noticed one or two of my friends and family are amongst the audience, hi, hi folks. Um, you will be aware of one of the features about me, so I couldn't resist. How to win a crisis? What happens when you're 3-0 down at half time in the Champions League final? Well, you don't give up, you try to fight back, you try to score three goals and win in a penalty shootout. I was there in Istanbul, one of the best nights of my life. Okay, um, three broad approaches to winning a crisis um, uh, that I'm going to explore in a little bit more detail now. First of all, there's a rational idea that a crisis requires specific answers. Secondly, what I'm terming here a velocity or an acceleration idea a crisis will accelerate existing trends. So it doesn't create anything new, it just speeds up what is already happening in terms of change and uh, uh, new traje trajectories. And a third element is opportunity. A crisis creates a moment that can be seized uh, by political actors to try to push their agenda and, uh, and their approach. Okay, a little bit more detail on each of those three. The rational approach is that when you have a crisis, it creates specific needs, or perhaps also it is highlighting specific gaps that exist. And that that means rationally, we should be trying to put forward specific responses uh, in relation to that. I think that's quite an idealistic perspective. Um, and one that kind of, it takes a very kind of technocratic perspective on, what, on, on how we understand things, uh, a non-ideological uh, point of view. Um, and I think in particular, there's a couple of flaws, it's kind of assuming that there must be an answer that we can arrive at, and also that there are no inbuilt obstacles to how we go about achieving this. So I'll explore that in relation to the COVID crisis as we go on through. The second one is a crisis gives the opportunity for accelerating existing trends. So it speeds up something that's already uh, happening. 
uh, it doesn't really create new responses. It's amplifying uh, what is already out there. Um, and again, just one indication of that, there's you know, a fair amount of research already been done in this area. An article I came across by Richard Haas in Foreign Affairs saying the pandemic will accelerate history rather than reshape it. Not every crisis is a turning point in that way. Um, so I'm going to explore how that relates to the COVID-19 situation as we go on through. The third way of thinking about this is that it creates an opportunity. Uh, a crisis is, if you like, creating a gap. And that means somebody can try to uh, take advantage of that uh, and put forward new ideas. That there's a body of literature, quite critical literature, about the rise of neoliberalism. So for example, Neo Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, Owen Jones, The Establishment, um, who argue that what we see with the rise of neoliberalism was a very deliberate project of, uh, to try to advance certain ideas, waiting for a moment when uh, uh, they could be put into effect. And we see that happening in the 1980s uh, in a couple of key countries in the United States and the United Kingdom under Margaret Thatcher and so on. Um, so that there was an ideological opportunity there. We can perhaps also though think about this opportunity hypothesis from a different perspective, a kind of a state opportunity. And again, I just came across this quote earlier this week from John Harris writing in The Guardian, uh, talking about an iron rule at work that politicians of left or right, so it's not particularly ideological, will always try to acquire powers on the basis of real or invented crisis. So the state tries to strengthen its capacity to do stuff in a crisis situation, irrespective of what that crisis might be. Um, so that's perhaps another way of thinking about this opportunity. It strengthens existing power structures. It will try to uh, draw in power to deal with things. Okay, so we have these three uh, approaches to considering uh, how to politicize a crisis, I suppose, or how to make uh, how to respond politically to a crisis. Let's take, start taking a look at uh, the actual COVID-19 uh, context, um, if that's not too depressing for everybody um, to go over this yet again. Um, you'll be very familiar with a lot of these, a lot of the, uh, perhaps some of the individual examples and stories that I'm going to be using to try to illustrate my case might be a little bit distinctive. So I hope I'll be able to bring in a couple of new uh, illustrative points that you, uh, to, the, to the discussion, to the narrative. So I'm going to be examining these three approaches, looking at examples of both conflict and cooperation uh, that have occurred as a result of COVID-19 across both the international level of politics and various different national levels, just to try to give a taste of the political response and the political impact around the place uh, uh, that has occurred. Um, so what we can do if we look at the international cooperation element Again, I can imagine one or two of my close friends, my family who are watching this, will be going immediately, oh, well, look at the image he's decided to use, an Aer Lingus airplane. So I have a fascination with aviation and things like this. Uh, but this is unusual for me. That's an Aer Lingus plane arriving in China. They've never flown to China before about April of this year, when they suddenly started flying about five times a day to pick up uh, protective equipment from uh, Chinese manufacturers. Uh, um, so uh, it's been a, quite a significant little indication uh, of one aspect of things. So what has happened here? In terms of international cooperation, the COVID crisis has underlined the extent of globalization um, uh, in terms of what has happened. So that uh, production and distribution of PPE equipment predominantly being made in China, uh, but also more broadly um, in Southeast Asia, um, but also other forms of collaboration and cooperation at the international level. The sharing of expertise about the virus um, uh, among companies and amongst the international community was quite dramatic as well. I mean, there's some very early comments, you know, almost as soon as that, uh, as I mentioned, in on January the 11th, when, the, when they identified the new, uh, that it was a new coronavirus form, um, almost immediately, um, the genetic uh, um, uh, transcript of that coronavirus was being circulated globally to allow as many companies as possible to try to start producing responses, to understand how this would work, to understand what you needed to try to do with it. And again, that's quite a significant illustration of the level of international cooperation that existed uh, uh, or has existed at some part of the response to the crisis. Again, we can see it in forms such as the development of the European Union's Solidarity Fund. Um, it perhaps came about uh, more slowly than we might ideally have wanted to see. Uh, it has come about with more arguments than perhaps might ideally have been the case. But again, it is, it is again an example of the forms of international cooperation that have been triggered 
by um, uh, the onset of the COVID crisis. Um, and again, I think generally the role of the WHO in trying to manage the international response to this crisis. Again, particularly the recently agreed Global Vaccines Procurement Agreement, the COVAX Agreement. Um, uh, sadly, not all countries have signed up for this, but most have. And again, it's an indication that um, essentially what the WHO are trying to do with that is to make sure that if and when a vaccine is produced, that it is made available globally so that, again, particularly poorer countries are not um, shoved to one side in a mad scramble to try to get hold of vaccines, that there's a fair and equal distribution of the vaccines wherever they are needed. So again, we're seeing that cooperative instinct working out at the international level in terms of how people are responding to the crisis. Of course, it is not just purely a cooperative response. So if we look at the international conflict dimension, I'm picking out some examples. There's many more that I could be using here. Uh, the United States sadly does not come out of this very well. It has made a decision to withdraw from the WHO uh, out of disagreements about how it is dealing with a number of issues, including the COVID crisis. Although as yet it has not fully withdrawn. Uh, again, the United States, even this week, has been, re been renewing its entire name calling of China, blaming them for almost deliberately causing and distributing the disease uh, in terms of some of the uh, pronouncements that have emerged. And again, seeking preferential deals for access to vaccines. So that whole principle of we should actually make sure that everyone gets some kind of an access to these vaccines if and when they emerge is not being respected by every single government, unfortunately. Again, we've seen remarkable efforts by the Chinese to provide aid, but I'd be very interested to see what kinds of strings might be associated with that aid. Um, in particular, um, uh, uh, how good countries' access to that aid might be if they start to make a fuss about the situation in Hong Kong or the situation in respect to Taiwan or in other places like that, or the Uyghur population uh, uh, or in Tibet. Um, so that's something that remains to be, uh, to be seen about how that will work. Um, and again, I talked about the EU Solidarity Fund. Um, uh, there's an article in, uh, on Politico.eu uh, looking at how both Poland and Hungary are threatening to block the entire recovery package um, because uh, they are uh, they don't like the way it might be tied into well you know are you uh, what are other the, the other reforms that you're taking part in, that are taking place in your country and so on so they're using this as a means of reducing EU criticism of the internal affairs of those countries that has been developing over the last few years um, so again we see the elements of conflict as well as the elements of cooperation uh, at the international level same story when we look at the national levels. Uh, there, is co there is fantastic cooperation and admirable work, but also frustrating the elements of conflict that we can see. The national cooperation elements, um, the uh, examples of national unity, of national cohesion, of people coming together, not just politicians, but communities, uh, states working uh, in cooperation and in harmony is remarkable. The sharing of resources within countries, the agreeing to restrictions on our lives, um, uh, and the extent to which people have kind of sort of said, okay, I don't, I don't like being locked up, essentially, for uh, a long period of time, but we know we have to do this. Um, so that collective understanding has been a very remarkable feature uh, of the COVID crisis. Um, that has also contributed in most countries to an extensive political consensus, all political parties saying, okay, look, uh, we'll get back to arguing with each other later. Now we have a real problem to solve. Let's see what we can do. Um, and I think also one of the things that to my mind has been absolutely remarkable are the little acts of shared humanity. Um, so the singing and the applauding from balconies um, that has taken place to try to just again to cheer people up. Um, in the United Kingdom, there was the case of Captain Tom Moore, uh, I think a 90 year old former British Army captain who decided, what, what can I do when the lockdown began? Um, I will try to walk a marathon around my garden over as many days as it might take. And I hope I can raise a little bit of money for my local NHS hospital. It became such a hit that he has already raised over 30 million pounds. And I think, again, quite a remarkable reaction to that. And again, the way in which sports clubs in Ireland, and again, particularly Gaelic uh, clubs, were full of activity. Like they were, what they were trying to do during the, the, the height of the lockdown in Ireland was to make use of those clubs to say, you, you know what's going on in your communities. You're young and fit people for the most part. So 
Can you go out and make sure that everyone in the community has access to food? If they need somebody to go to the shops for them, can you sort that out? Again, a remarkable coming together of populations. So we can see that national cooperation uh, occurring as well. And then there's the national conflict. A few examples. Uh, between regions, uh, Scotland and Wales uh, adopting different policies to England uh, and saying, no, we're not going to do it that way, we're going to do it our own way. Again, we see regional differences in the uh, approach to health policies and to lockdowns within Spain. Um, so again, uh, elements of national difference, perhaps national conflict. Um, and more explicitly, I came across reference to um, uh, extensive conflict in Australia between the different states um, uh, where the states were basically saying we don't want people coming in to our state from other states within Australia uh, and that's led to politicians from both sides of the uh, the political divide in Australia the Labour Party and the National Party uh, talking in one case about the dangerous idea of, su of succession within Australia um, and again Scott Morrison talking about it is felt like Australia could break apart uh, over uh, differing reactions to the COVID crisis. Uh, so again, we're seeing the tensions, political tensions that have been produced as a result uh, of the situation. Um, okay, so the responses to this, if we start bringing this back in, so we've got conflict, we've got cooperation, we can see these two forces pulling in different directions. What does this tell us about the overall response? Is it going back to the rational approach? Is it more related to the, um, the acceleration of ideas that I talked about earlier? Or is it again related to the opportunity to create uh, new messages and a, a new political agenda? On the rational issue, uh, and I was delighted to get this particular image, that is Tony Holohan, who was the former uh, uh, leader of NEFET, which is the Irish National public health emergency team um, and uh, I thought it was interesting the way in which one public response to that was to draw a mural of Tony Holan who's this kind of medical bureaucrat essentially uh, as Superman uh, and there has been kind of remarkable that he's been very whilst he was in charge of this um, he was remarkably calm and not trying to downplay the risks but just being very trying to reassure people look we are doing the best we can and i think it's led to a renewed respect for the role of experts so there's a rational dimension in that uh, we're looking to um to medical leaders to say this is what's happening this is what we need to do um and i think for the most part uh, the vast majority of people have responded um, calmly and rationally to that um, but i think also we also have to recognize the clear limits of that kind of technocratic approach. Um, so the medical experts are very good at telling us what we need to do to try to respond to, the, to COVID as a crisis. They're going to be less well placed when it comes to balancing that against other demands and other interests in our society. So to what extent do we keep on chasing COVID if the economy is slowly imploding? So how do we balance those two? To what extent do we just focus on COVID when that has means perhaps other diseases become overlooked? I know certainly in the Irish case, which I was trying to follow as best I could, um, uh, the number of people uh, turning up for cancer screening and even cancer appointments for treatment went way down during the lockdown period. People were just scared to go out. So COVID, you might be sa saving yourself from COVID, but putting yourself at greater risk from other diseases. So it's this balancing factor. How do you deal with competing interests? That is really where politicians have to start earning their money, their corn, uh, when they try to come into this. Um, and again, in terms of some of what is going on, some of it is slightly irrational. I was uh, checking on this. As far as I know still, the required uh, distancing uh, in different countries, is it one meter, one and a half meters, two meters? It varies enormously. Um, uh, uh, around the place. So uh, countries have been trying to put in different ideas and understandings of how far apart it's necessary to stand to try to protect ourselves. So again, it's not all clear cut how we need to go about dealing with this. It's not all subject to just simply the rational answer. We have it there. All we need to do is follow those guidelines. It is more complex than that. And that's where politics comes back into it. So on the political dimension, is it the acceleration model? I'm going to be concluding here, perhaps, but we don't, can't quite tell yet which form of acceleration. And I'm going to just pick out three of those to illustrate the complexities here. Okay, one answer is that this is accelerating the opportunities of globalization and illustrating the irreversibility 
of globalization. All of that deep structure of connections, those Irish planes flying to Beijing to pick up PPE, uh, protective equipment, uh, the various other linkages of exchanging information globally uh, 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 to try to, uh, to deal with responding to the virus, of providing uh, medical treatments for it and so on. Um, uh, and again, uh, one article that I came across, Bjorn Hacker, writing in International Politics and Society, talking about, he's talking here about the European Union, but I think we can take this at a broader level as well, um, that, you know, it's the final proof that what is happening is a truly transnational world where we need to have transnational responses uh, to what is going on. One country cannot just simply try to close itself off uh, from the COVID crisis. If you do that, you're essentially closing yourself off from the entire world, from tourism, from trade, from other forms of communication. We can do that for a short period of time to respond to an, an, uh, a sharp emergency. We cannot sustain that from a longer point of view. Um, so perhaps it's indicating the strength and the irrever irreversibility of globalization. However, there are others who take exactly the counterpoint of view, who say that actually globalization has been struggling the last few years and you get deglobalization, stronger nationalism, uh, starting to come back on the political agenda. And again, Paul Mason, again writing in International Politics and Society Journal, um, talking about the hoarding nature of some nation states, of trying to uh, get uh, privileged access to protective equipment, to ventilators and so on, shutting down their borders, um, uh, and again, even blaming other countries for causing the crisis, or if they didn't do that deliberately, at least perhaps um, uh, uh, um, uh, not being careful enough to make sure that they didn't export the crisis by accident of the COVID uh, situation. Um, so again, uh, Mason argues deglobalization is a fact over the last um, 10, 15 years. The pressures of countries uh, acting in a much more protectionist way. And we do see some of those features when we examine the COVID situation as well. So again, it's accelerating trends. Which one is going to win out is still remains to be seen. I've got one last one as well to put in, the rise of China. And here I've got an article from the Financial Times um, uh, that was talking about it. Again, talking about the pandemic accelerating the economic shift towards Asia and particularly the rise of China as uh, not just an economic power, but a global power in many ways. Um, so again, uh, this is one of the potential accelerating factors uh, that has been created as a result of COVID. But I want to also look at this idea of crisis as opportunity for other ideas to seize the moment. So, is it an opportunity? Um, I should explain, by the way, the image here. I couldn't really think of a good image for opportunity. Um, so I decided, oh, to hell with it. I'm putting in uh, uh, the front cover of Elvis Costello's uh, Get Happy LP. One of, the, one of his greatest LPs, one of his, you know, I'm a huge fan. Uh, and one of the best songs on that is called Opportunity. That was the best I could do for the image. Okay, so what are the ideas here? I'm going to look at green issues, I'm going to look at new left issues, and I'm going to look at new right issues. Do, we, do any of these provide the opportunity to try to seize this particular moment to push their agenda more strongly? On the green side, um, uh, I think the climate change agenda has had a bad COVID crisis. It's been pushed in the background. It was just starting uh, through 2019 to get real uh, impact and to start to force politicians to try to think really seriously, what do we do about climate change? Um, uh, but COVID has not been good for the climate agenda. Um, uh, it's, just, it's been a distraction. So this is no, uh, climate is no longer the, the, uh, uh, such an important political topic. It is requiring huge redirection of funds towards health issues rather than towards climate issues. And we can also suggest that, well, if and when the world gets back to so-called normal, well, uh, lots of people are going to say, I want to go on a few flights around to uh, on holidays. I've been cooped up for far too long. I think we're going to see a surge of going back to behaviours that we've got used to, which are not very environmentally friendly. Um, um, and it's going to have that kind of a knock on effect, even if we uh, and, uh, and I think even in one little sense, the number of uh, um, face masks, plastic face masks that are now being found dropped on streets and will slowly form part of the plastic pollution 
for the world is going to be increased as well. Um, so we can see there, um, there's an article from Car Carola Kluck uh, looking at this, COVID-19 is not good news for the climate and even bad news. Um, so I think this is an opportunity. Uh, we, we, have, we cannot lose sight of the climate crisis, but we're going to have to get back to that at some point because it has certainly gone down our priorities, uh, the political priorities uh, over the course of the last few months, uh, sadly so. It, the crisis, I think, has also challenged us to try to think about new forms of economic behaviour. We've seen massive, massive state intervention to try to shore up economies. Um, uh, it's forced us to rethink like, things like, well, who, who are the economically valuable people within our societies? Um, so, of course, a lot of attention on nurses, doctors, uh, and the, work, the astonishing work and the astonishing bravery they've been showing uh, over these last few months. But also, the people who go out on bicycles to deliver our food have been pretty important to keeping us going over the last period of time. Uh, again, people, you know, like sort of um, refuse collectors uh, going out in there uh, to collect the bins and collect the rubbish around the place to try to keep our streets clean. I think it's, it should be leading to a revaluation of who we think are important to keep us all going and to keep us all alive within a society. So I think one of the things to come out of the COVID crisis for me is it underpins the extent to which an economy has to be about maintaining a strong society rather than just economic growth on its own. Um, economic growth can be beneficial, but it's not the only thing that we need from an economy. We also just need it there to protect our societies uh, in, a, in a broader way. And it's brought in arguments about, again, you know, is this going to strengthen arguments about a, a universal basic income um, as being one of the ways to try to create greater security and greater social cohesion uh, within our societies from an economic point of view. Against that, the markets might not be very happy if we keep on talking about massive state intervention, higher wealth taxes to pay for this, higher profit uh, taxes on profits to try to pay for all of this um, over the longer period of time. And there will be a massive debt crisis looming in the future. So there's an awful lot of economic challenges. So it's not clear uh, that necessarily these kinds of changes from an economic point of view are going to happen. And then on the right side, um, uh, sorry, I was, uh, that's a, a little idea. Sorry, I've forgotten I had Yanis in there again. Yanis Varoufakis and his motorbike from when he was Greek foreign minister uh, under the Syriza government, um, talking about the way in which the, uh, the financial markets have just been treating COVID-19 as, well, so what? We can still make profits um, out of this, um, and we are going to try to do that as much as possible. So stock markets have actually been increasing in value. Uh, throughout this crisis, which has been highly damaging to the real economy. And Varoufakis is arguing that we've become prey to a situation where the, the stock market economy has taken over from real economic activity uh, in terms of priorities and where wealth lies. And that's distorting and disrupting uh, economic responses to the crisis. The final bit is about the new, the new right, not just the new left approaches that could emerge here. Because whilst COVID, COVID has highlighted um, the, you know, the need for social coherence, the need for social protection, it also has highlighted the very difficult job of balancing people's rights and freedoms, uh, and perhaps forces us to try to think about, well, what, do we, what are we thinking about when we think about the social contract that we are trying to keep in place between the individual and the state? And again, uh, in more than one case, we have situations where there are those who might try to take political advantage out of this COVID crisis. Um, uh, in terms of how they can use this in, in certain ways. Um, so again, whilst it's a crisis, whilst it produces opportunities, all kinds of people can try to seize this. Okay, so let me get to, to, to my conclusions and then my risky prediction um, or two. So in conclusions, um, I would say there is some evidence of a degree of rational response, but I think this is more confined to the more technical medical questions that have emerged as a result of COVID. Now, governments have had to respond to that. So there's a political dimension to it straight away. It's the governments who've been saying, these are the new rules we need to follow uh, as a result of what we're being advised by our medical experts. But the broader political questions about at what point do we start trying to reopen the economy? At what point, um, uh, how do we go about managing that overall process? Uh, that's where the political, that's where I think just simply saying, oh, there's a rational answer to it, is harder to, uh, to, to agree with that. So I think 
the rational dimension is limited and we need to think beyond that uh, in terms of what is happening. I think there's plenty of evidence of acceleration taking place, but I'm not convinced there's a very clear pattern to that. We're still seeing uh, a tug of war between the globalization elements and the deglobalization, the nationalist protectionist elements. Um, uh, so uh, that battle has been intensified as a result of the COVID crisis. Uh, and it's very hard at the moment to see who will be the winner. And I don't think yet there's been any clear claiming of the space by an opportunist political force, a good one or a bad one. Uh, although, as I say, I think, for example, the Greens have had a rather bad crisis so far. I hope they recover. Um, uh, for the sake of our planet. Um, so I'm going to try to finish up with some predictions and I couldn't resist the image. I was trying to think, what image can I use with this? Uh, and I came across the village idiot Irish pub. Um, and I thought, yeah, <laughs> uh, these are the predictions. And, you know, kind of, I hope I'm not quite the village idiot uh, about uh, trying to deal with this. Um, but you know, it is a risky business making predictions in this kind of, kind of area. Um, I would be suggesting, I don't think a deglobalization nationalist, old, old style nationalist approach can last. I don't think that can be sustained. Um, I would like, what, what I'd like to see happening is not just going back to the old forms of globalization, which I think we're too focused on economics, growth and market interests. I think we need an alter global, globalization to start to emerge of thinking about how we can make globalization, not just about economic wealth, but also about things like economic solidarity. And that is in turn, to my mind, also requires fairer political structures, both at the international level and at the national level uh, of what we've tried to look at. Um, and um, uh, I would be arguing that what we need to be trying to do is find a way not just to address the immediate crisis, uh, but also to try and think more broadly, because we do are going to be coming out of a COVID crisis, still faced with a climate crisis still faced with a, cri with a crisis of nationalist aggression uh, in a number of different places. And I think one of the positive things about COVID again to me is the benefits of cooperation, of working as social animals, working together to cooperate uh, as being one of the most important things that we could do. So those are my broad ideas. I think given all of what I've been saying, I want to finish up with one last slide, if I've got things right. Um, uh, and it goes back to that rational idea. As I say, I don't think rationalism is the best explanation of what is going on. Uh, but when I was trying to think again about an image to associate with rationalism, one person or one character came to mind. And I think it's probably appropriate to end with, um, to say, I'll skip over that one. I hope we all live long and prosper coming out of this. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for, for the good laugh at the end and for, for those very uh, interesting and, and re really rich presentations and, and, and uh, thoughts that you um, uh, presented. I think this is giving us a, a good uh, um, array of um, things to, to chew on now to discuss. And I would like to uh, move into the discussion by um, reminding um, everybody that we do have um, a questions tool um, um, set up. Um, you find it, um, there is the link in the uh, chat functions. It's an online questions org page where you can type in your questions and you can also uh, upvote other questions. So this is um, our attempt to, to bring in uh, the, the a large number of um, people in front of the screens um, to, to ask questions and it will be Orian and myself to um, um, uh, moderate um, um, this a little bit. But now to kick off the discussion, I would like to um, hand the, um, give the word to um, Orian Caligaro. Um, maybe you have also some personal thoughts or some reflections and, and would like to kick off the discussion. Orian. Okay, thank you, Sabine. Uh, thank you, Michael, for for this presentation um, and, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, yeah, this is uh, indeed very uh, tricky to reflect on uh, a crisis of this kind uh, still going on. Um, and uh, I think it's, it was really interesting what, what, you, what you did uh, to try to, to find uh, some um, potential frames to, to, to make sense of, of, uh, of what is, is going on. 
Um, and um, I will mainly um, make some remarks and, and, uh, and mainly also uh, trying to bring in uh, other examples and to see how do you think they would fit in your explanations or whether they indicate uh, different trends or uh, maybe um, a first big issue and it's uh, very much related to um, this question of uh, the relation of the individual and the state um, um, and also this related to this issue of, of rationality that you mentioned. Um, you said that um, at least for a certain period, because I think that things evolved, but um, we could see that there was a certain trust in the authorities, in the experts, as you said. Um, but I think that it also, uh, the fact that the political power uh, had to rely on a evolving scientific, scientific expertise uh, also created um, a lot of confusion, I think, in public opinion um, and potentially a mistrust. So this is maybe a first question, whether you, you see this as well, because I think that the, the scientific community uh, which was supposed to, to advise the political power and to make very uh, extreme decision, and as we say, concerning public uh, liberties, uh, the economic life of uh, entire nations. Um, this scientific, scientific community was uh, dealing with a sort of moving target uh, because the COVID-19 uh, was a, a new form of, um, of, 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 of coronavirus. And, uh, the reaction of the public authorities were sort of following uh, what the scientific community was finding out. And of course, the decisions were also, as you, as you said, sometimes leading to uh, contradictory uh, decisions. So of course, when a nation like at the beginning, the UK or Sweden or the Netherlands uh, say that they will rely on herd uh, immunity, uh, and not uh, intervene uh, drastically like other nations did. And here again, they rely on a certain scientific knowledge. So even at the beginning, they were completely uh, sometimes uh, opposing interpretations. And, and it goes on with the examples that you gave, the different uh, potential distances, or I just take the example of, of Belgium where I live, uh, like in many nations, we were supposed to wear a mask and we just uh, outside, outdoors, and we just were informed uh, yesterday that we will no longer be obliged to wear masks because apparently it was not uh, this big political decision and sanit health uh, decision was uh, no longer justified. So I think that at the level of the citizens, um, there is first this, this question of, the tricky connection between scientific knowledge uh, and and uh, and uh, the public authorities, and and then how uh, this uh, translates into into political action and 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 the mistrust again it can create within the 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 population. Um, so this is a, a first uh, uh, because. And for instance, going back to conflict, um, in, in Sweden, for instance, after a while, uh, the, the Swedish citizens uh, demonstrated, which is apparently extremely rare, uh, like to have mass demonstrations against the government. Uh, and it was because uh, they, they wanted their, their uh, government to intervene and to, to take measures. Um, so here there was a clear, uh, a clear, uh, 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 conflict with the population criticizing uh, the, the decision taken by, by the government. Um, and so I was wondering whether this could have a lasting, uh, lasting uh, impact. Um, another, uh, another type of, of issues that maybe you, you did not mention is uh, um, 
how this crisis also revealed, uh, I mean, revealed or, or highlighted um, social cleavages. Uh, and I think, of course, the reception of the, the decisions taken by the public authorities could be completely different according to where you stand in the society. Uh, and uh, because, of course, you know, you had also at the beginning of the confinement, this sort of a romanticiz romanticization of the confinement with privileged uh, people going on the countryside and enjoying almost a break uh, from uh, the daily, uh, their daily life. And, uh, and in the same time, uh, um, other types of population trapped in, uh, in the cities and, uh, or without uh, even a place to go. And, and uh, so I think here also, and sometimes they were in the city where I live in Brussels, there were even riots uh, related partly to, to the confinement and to the conditions of confinement in, in popular uh, neighborhoods in, in Brussels, for instance. Uh, so here I see, um, yeah, again, it's not necessarily conflicts between uh, groups of the population, but something, uh, a crisis that revealed even more these, uh, these uh, cleavages. Um, yes, maybe at this, uh, this is already two big uh, uh, topics. Uh, of course, I had one huge question uh, on this idea of um, alter globalization, you, you gave uh, uh, some, um, because indeed here the predictions are very complicated to do uh, with economics seeing that for instance, a digital flow, the digital globalization was really much intensified by, by the crisis. Um, um, but uh, yeah, there was also when you were talking about opportunity, whether, uh, there was a, a green opportunity or not here again, maybe this is completely anecdotal, uh, but this stop when, when the globalization kind of uh, stands still for, for a couple of months, um, I think that at least in certain parts of the population who could, who had the luxury, the luxury to make such uh, observation, you know, to see how life can be when uh, everything slows down that uh, planes uh, stop flying in the sky and you know that uh, uh, actually for some time the um, the global warming sort of uh, slow down uh, uh, because of so I think again for some privileged people this could this was also the occasion uh, to see uh, what at least a certain uh, yeah a slowing down at least of globalization uh, could could bring um, so here again, it's if you have some aspect to 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 add to your this pro this proposal of a an alter um, globalization, um, and maybe just a final thing, um, uh, yeah, because also talking about unity and when you were talking about uh, people uh, uh, singing from the balconies about politicization, because uh, indeed they were they were uh, forms of uh, unity. Uh, in a moment of crisis. But I don't know if uh, you, you remark that um, in this singing and the fact of uh, making posters on, at the balconies, they were also political messages. Uh, and in this case, it was to criticize uh, the choices made in the past that you could qualify the, the uh, type of neoliberal economy that uh, implied the cuts in uh, health uh, services. So uh, on the balconies where people were, were singing, sometimes they were also uh, addressing because they could not go down uh, in, the, in, in the streets, uh, but they were also, they were political messages to say that this crisis reveal um, uh, the, 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 yeah, the dramatic effects of political choices in the past, especially related to to block public services. Um, so yeah, is there also an, a, a sort of politiza politicization, uh, um, yeah, which was uh, provoked or, or intensified uh, um, by, by the COVID-19? Uh, last week again in Belgium, sorry for taking a, a very, a, the, same, the same example, but there was, there was a, a massive uh, demonstration in favor of public health 
uh, to say it was really nice uh, to uh, applaud uh, uh, the nurses and doctors during the, the, the confinement, uh, but now we need serious uh, um, change of policies and long-term uh, change. Um, yes, now I really stop and, and, and leave uh, uh, maybe uh, Sabine uh, at something or, or we'll see whether we have other questions. I would, actually, I would, I would suggest that we let Michael first answer that was also a, a rich uh, um, um, uh, discussant um, contribution. So Michael, maybe you have some thoughts on what Orian just uh, pre presented. Uh, thank you, thank you, Oriane. Uh, to try to speed it all up, should I just say you had four questions? So yes, no, only on Wednesdays, and perhaps no. Um, <laughs> uh, that okay. I, I'll actually take it in reverse order there because uh, what you're saying there about the, the the mixed messages. Yeah, well, I mean, at, at certain level, yeah, of course, politics is all about people having different perspectives and different uh, uh, approaches. Uh, that's a that's a really important part of human diversity in politics. Um, so. I don't think that goes against, you know, it's not that we want everybody to be thinking exactly the same. Um, and I think that critical idea of, um, uh, you know, sort of, you know, putting a lot of the, the blame, not for the COVID crisis, but on, on the, the, the responses to it and sort of saying, well, look, for years now, we've been running down our health services, making them more lean and efficient. But that means suddenly we're in a period where actually we need extra capacity, spare capacity that could have been utilised. Uh, again, the way in which, you know, sort of, um, uh, I know certainly in the NHS in the UK, uh, where health workers will say, look, our workloads have been going up and up and up. And we're, we were exhausted coming into the COVID crisis and then being asked to perform miracles. And they did. Um, uh, so, um, to my mind, it's kind of, it's, it's, that is still actually the end of a, a, a previous cycle. Uh, this is still the slow death of neoliberalism. Uh, and that's perhaps something I should have talked about. Um, I was busy predicting 12 years ago, oh, this is it, this is the end of neoliberalism. It is, but it sometimes takes a long time for those changes to really come through. And I hope that this will be an accelerating factor. Uh, sadly, in the UK case, at any rate, you can see that the Conservative Party is almost trying to um, put forward the idea of, oh, we're going to try to reinvest in some of the poor and underprivileged communities as part of the Brexit project, but also as, a pro uh, as part of a project of trying to seize control of traditional labor areas that are now much more in flux in terms of their political allegiances to a, a narrow English nationalist uh, outlook and an English nationalist approach being led by Dominic Cummings in the way in which they're approaching. Uh, these kinds of things. So yeah, I'm not surprised by the mix of messages um, because people have different political perspectives. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays into um, post-crisis politics as to who can, which parties come out with good records. I don't think it's going to be decided ideologically. I think it's more about which individuals were seen to have done a good job. You know, like somebody like Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, I think has come out with this really, really well, more power to her in terms of what she's been able to achieve and what she's been able to do. Um, uh, I don't think Boris Johnson has come out of it quite as well, but oh, there we go. Um, so we get those kinds of reactions. The ultra globalization issue, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it's an idea I've been playing with for a while, and there's lots of people have been. Um, I wanted to end with my predictions on a positive note, so that's why I put that in there. Yeah, let's let's try to help the positive the positive things because it's too easy to look at the conflicts and say, oh well, there's a lot going wrong uh, with with what's happening uh, at the moment. Um, and I do think, um, uh, you know, there are issues about what is happening um, uh, in relation to climate control, climate change, and so on. Um, it was actually slightly disheartening to my perspective to see when there was this massive economic shutdown, the, gr the, the slow level of dampening of climate change. It didn't actually produce this massive turnaround. It slowed it down. But we were still, you know, the, 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 the global climate situation was still um, getting worse. Uh, and I think, again, I, I was tempted this morning to say a little bit more about the, uh, to add in a slide about um, digitalization. Um, as more and more people get used to shopping online to, I mean, one thing that I've always hated is I, I like using currency. I like notes and coins. But now I've had to get used to just you tap with your card and I feel I have no, no sense of control over money anymore. Um, as a result of that. So there's these, these big, big changes coming through. Um, uh, again, it's how politically, political actors decide what do we want to achieve? How are we going to respond to this? Can we build new forms of global cooperation? Um, or are we going to just simply descend into new forms of global conflict? 
in terms of how we go about uh, we go go about responding. I shall remain positive for the moment and say I do think we're intelligent creatures for the most part, um, and that therefore we should have the wit and the wisdom to say we've got to be careful uh, that. Uh, if we go down that conflict path, um, uh, that is a very dangerous route to, to choose and see how we get on with that. Um, uh, I've got to come back to the one final point I might make about that later on as well. Um, I'll come back to it uh, in the, answering the first question. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, one of the areas I didn't touch about is all of the, the different social cleavages built into the reactions to the crisis. So it's, there's a class dimension. There's an ethnicity dimension to it. Um, there's a gender dimension to how people have reacted and responded uh, to the crisis. And even again, you know, uh, an element of conflict between age groups. Um, it's those terrible young people going around uh, infecting us, um, decent, not so young people. Uh, this is outrageous, by the way, to any of my students who are still watching. Don't worry, I'm really happy to be in a classroom with you. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not, I'm not uh, agreeing with that perspective. But it has produced all of these different social, potential social cleavages. Again, it highlights the extent to which there is an important challenge of providing renewed means of social cohesion. And I think it's something that we've lost over the last 20, 30 years, partly through things like digitalization and uh, online technology, which means we're all great at typing things into a, into a keyboard and not so good at actually dealing face to face with human beings. Um, and then other forms of pressure like the neoliberal one, which have, which have pushed us away from um, social structure and social cohesion. Um, and I think we need to regain that cohesion and that cooperation in terms of what we're trying to do. Uh, I think that, that that's one of the things that the crisis has revealed. Um, I find the first question you start out with the trust in authorities, but also some confusion and some mistrust. Um, and again, I think this comes back to that idea of um, different points of view and different perspectives, the, the positive and the negative mes messages. Um, I hope that the mistrust is a minority. Now, a minority can be very disruptive. I, I had a couple of slides. I was going to say a little bit more about the social contract, about Hobbes and Leviathan and so on. Um, and in essence, you know, kind of, you know, one of the ideas is that, well, 90, 95% of people tend to, tend to get along passably well. The 5% have an awful, uh, awfully strong ability to disrupt that social network by being more aggressive, more pushy, um, more demanding in certain ways. So yes, it's how do we deal with this small little, the, the, the disruptive minority are saying, I refuse to wear, uh, as I reach across and get my, my, I refuse to wear my mask uh, uh, at any one time, or I, I refuse to obey the rules about um, only so many people going out together and you're not allowed to be so close together and all this kind of thing. Okay, it's easy to highlight one or two cases. I think they are minority cases. Quite, quite few people are not, are, are completely ignoring these restrictions and completely acting like um, there is nothing to worry about. Um, uh, but as I say, that can have a disruptive effect on the broader social cohesion, and that is something certainly uh, to watch out for. I, I, I think it would be foolish to start going out and arresting loads of people over this. I think you've got to adopt um, a sensible approach of persuasion, and I think that's where, again, it's not just, I mean, to my mind, politics is not just what a politician tells us. Politics is what we engage in as citizens, and we have a, we have a civic responsibility. So I don't like wearing a mask. But I do that. Occasionally I forget, but I, I'm happy to do that because to my mind, it's also gesturing to my fellow citizens. We all have to be, behave properly in that kind of way. So we need to find these ways of reinforcing our cooperative instincts and re reinforcing those dimensions uh, of, the, of the crisis. Thank you, Michael. I actually, I wanted to encourage um, people to, to submit questions, but I see on my own uh, browser window that the um, questions tool seems to have collapsed, which is of course not as it is meant to be. Um, if this is the case, so I was seeing for sometimes a, a number of questions and I wanted to bring them in. Now they are gone, so I cannot access them myself at the moment and I'm sorry for that. So maybe for the sake of um, a simplicity, let's return to the chat function. So if you have any things to, to ask or, or points to bring in comments, please uh, make use of that uh, chat function. I'm so sorry for the um, technical struggles that we are facing here. 
Well, and Sabine, could, could I intervene, Sabine, just very briefly on that? To anybody who either has asked a question and it gets, it gets lost or it gets overlooked as we try to go through things, or else you haven't asked one but you've got a question in your mind, by all means, please just email me um, at, uh, here in Lille. I mean, uh, I'm very happy, you know, if somebody wants to raise, a quiz, raise an issue, have an online chat with me, discussion about that, I'm very happy to try to respond to any follow-up queries that you might have. Okay, yeah. So um, thank you, Michael. And for the moment, let's also um, have the um, uh, chat function for, for interaction. Let me try to, to formulate myself um, um, a point that was that I was um, thinking about while listening to your presentation. So you were kind of framing the um, COVID crisis in terms of three different uh, responses, the rational um, approach, the accelerating a uh, 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 phenomenon that trends are accelerated and then the um, um, opportunities that um, are kind of popping up and be, that we can use. And I initially I wanted to ask you, what do you think in, in empirical terms, what do we observe? Is there a dominant way to, um, to, frame, to, to, to frame that crisis or to um, perceive it? And you kind of answered that towards the end, um, moving a bit or shifting a bit to the um, um, uh, opportunity hypothesis. So therefore, uh, my question comes a bit from that angle. What do you think um, are the, the main lessons to be learned from, from that crisis? Um, um, and, and what um, um, are there new opportunities for learning um, um, emerging through the crisis, um, according to your perception, according to your reading? Um. I think two things that come out of that. I mean, uh, one thing perhaps, and this is actually something also in the, that responds a little bit to Oriane's first question as well, um, about um, clarity, confusion, the role of science. I think one of the things that comes through is again, the importance of science, but also learning that science is not omniscience. It doesn't, scientists are doing their best to try to understand the world goes around them. And, you know, I suppose we as social scientists, and that, that is a fairly inferior life form in terms of uh, that many hard scientists would see it as being. Um, uh, but, you know, even, you know, what we were trying to do, obviously, you know, we're dealing with an imperfect knowledge and of trying to make the best sense we can of that through thinking rationally and logically about things. And um, rational, logical approaches in that sense, are useful. Um, uh, it's, it's a basic tool, a basic method of how we need to go about trying to do things. So I, I will hope we get back to that of saying we need to think these things through rationally, logically. That doesn't always produce the single clear-cut answer that is going to work in every single situation. So we've got to be aware that science is always successive approximations of how to try to respond to things. Um, um, so I kind of see it in, in, that, in that sort of way. Um, and more broadly, the political... Again, Sabine, your, your point more broadly about kind of political impact, is it? Or? Um, yeah, the, the, um, um, well, the lessons learned, so to say, and, and the opportunities that might arise that we could seize um, in order to at least make something out of the crisis. Yeah, I, th I think that's where, I mean, what I was trying to focus on. We have the opportunity here. If we're looking at what the crisis has done, it is, pro it is provoked lots of cooperation, it has provoked some conflict. And we have a choice to make about which direction we want to go. Um, whether we want to prioritize one side of that or the other uh, in, ter in terms of uh, the, the development, the how, the, how our global structures and our national structures develop as we come out of the COVID situation. So there's a lesson there. We can choose just to, just choose to forget about it, which I think would be fatal because our, um, uh, deeply unfortunate because I think inevitably we would face further crisis later on um, uh, of similar uh, nature. And again, this was highly, you know, the whole COVID crisis was very well signaled. You go back to the early 2000s and there were reports coming out sort of saying, we will have a major re respiratory virus infection that is going to be deeply disruptive. It'll kill a lot of people and it'll disrupt our economy. So it was, it's been known for 15, 20 years. And again, there's been plenty of other uh, health pandemics, the Zika virus, the Ebola virus, and so on, uh, mm -hmm. which I suppose for us privileged people in the West, we were, it was easier to put those to one side because, oh, that happens somewhere else. 
it's not happening for us. Uh, and again, the earlier res respiratory ailments like SARS and MERS did not, ex did not um, explode to the extent that uh, COVID has done, COVID-19 has done. Um, so again, uh, it, it's up to us to learn those lessons. You know, we, we shouldn't ignore the evidence before us of, uh, of what the challenges are. And I think those challenges clearly are ones best met with by cooperation rather than seeing this as an economic opportunity or an opportunity for political aggrandizement, whatever it might be. Okay, thank you. I do see that now um, questions are coming in via the chat functions. That is good. So um, let me um, uh, begin with the first one that was also one I saw on the um, um, online questions talk tool when it was still work, uh, working. So um, um, Arthur Amelot um, is asking, you mentioned it briefly, but tax wise, could you elaborate your thought regarding the necessary change of politics? And if so, whether from the European Central Bank or the large package of EU funded grants for member states. So um, if I understand correctly, this is a question about um, uh, what is the, um, um, yeah, the, the uh, changes um, necessary in the um, in, in financial terms that we do see um, um, uh, coming out of that crisis. And Sabine, if I may, so that we can yes, sure. the questions, I see another question, yeah, which is also ahead. related to the EU and whether a deeper integration or even uh, federalism uh, at the European level could be an answer for a crisis of this type. So I think both are the re related uh, in terms of if there are, yeah, a deeper uh, EU integration. Uh, oh, yes, I did not. Sorry, I'm talking without... Uh, Camera, yes, but whether um, yeah, more EU could be a solution, and also then on the on the at the fiscal uh, level. Mm -hmm. Michael, okay, what do you think? Shall I respond on that? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Um, on the EU issue, I was going to say a little bit more specifically about the EU, but then I decided uh, I I wouldn't. Um, to some extent, you could almost argue what I was saying there about um, there's a a default scenario that a state will always try to seize the opportunity of any crisis to expand its power. Um, well, you could, the European Union is taking this crisis to try to expand its power. So pretty much any time the European Union is faced with a crisis, the response tends to be from within the European Union bubble, we need more Europe. Um, possibly, maybe, but I, you know, the European Union is predominantly an economic entity. So, for example, I don't think it is necessarily the best agency or the best framework to deal with health issues. Why not make use of a broader pan-European, not just EU, framework for that? Um, or indeed, why not make use of the World Health Organization as the best framework for trying to pursue responses that deal with health. Um, that seems, so I think sometimes for within the European bubble, there can be a tendency to sort of say, this is, we need more Europe. Actually on something like COVID, we need more United Nations. We need more at that level, not necessarily regionalist responses. There can be a benefit to that, but not necessarily. Now I think some things like maybe, you know, how do you operate things like Schengen and cross-border agreements? Uh, Perhaps there's, a, there's more of a discussion to be had there. Um, so I understand why there's this demand for, well, we, maybe this is where we need to push forward European integration, but I'm not sure that's coming from the sense of this is the, most, the best way to respond to COVID and more that it's, oh, we need more Europe. That's what we've been saying anyway. So this is another opportunity to advance that argument about more Europe. So I'd, I'd be cautious there about just simply automatically of um, um, strengthening that centralization of power. Uh, uh, because again, I think one of the things that, to my mind, comes out of this is the way in which governments and political institutions have had to rethink how do you engage with your public? Because that public relationship, the citizens and how they obey and how they accept what's going on, um, has become much more uh, clear cut in this kind of a situation. Um, uh, so I think, again, governments have had to be quite cautious about this. And, you know, again, uh, I cannot help pointing out the famous uh, or infamous Gulfgate uh, episode in Ireland a few weeks ago, where about 80 different political leaders uh, met together in a golf club to have a bit of a party. 
uh, which led to the resignations of one government minister, one junior minister who attended, and this is again breaching uh, uh, containment rules in Ireland, and also, of course, eventually led to the resignation of Phil Hogan, the Irish commissioner, who had flown back for his holidays and went to this. Um, so again, that sense of, you know, the governments and political leaders need to show responsibility as well. If they're asking this of their citizens, they can't do something different. Um, so it's a two-way process uh, that needs to be engaged with there. The broader question I think was that Arthur came out with uh, Amelo uh, about around the whole kind of economic dimension. Um, okay, I'm not an economist, I'm not a political economist, so um, uh, uh, how do you go about dealing with uh, creating new economic financial structures and economic financial responses? But again, it just seems to me that quite clearly the economic model that existed eight months ago has had to be at very least suspended. So suddenly governments are printing money essentially to try to keep society going. And governments are giving all kinds of handouts in ways they would not otherwise have done. How long can we sustain that? I don't know, but it also means that when we come out of this period of sustainment, do we just go back to saying, well, the old economic model was working fine? No, to my mind it was, you know, this is a very clear indication that one company focused on making profit still depends on an entire social structure working for this to be able to for, for them to be able to carry out their functions and that means they have to rethink their economic and social responsibility coming out of this as well uh, that profit maximization if it produces social damage is always going to be something a, a high risk factor now i don't know if that's directly addressing that particular question but it's the first idea that came to me in relation to it yeah, there, there, there are some uh, questions in going into that EU uh, realm, and I think you commented um, um, on, on several of those um, um, very um, uh, nicely. Um, there is another interesting question I find from Nicole Eichstedt, and she's asking or, or um, writing, could you talk about the events um, as uh, manifestations about social topics such as Black Lives Matter and the importance or impact um, for the COVID scenario. So um, the, uh, Black Lives Matter, as we, I mean, this is a, a movement that we all witness while being uh, in, in lockdown and we're, we're watching on TV or we're um, uh, in, in some instance, part, instances participating in, in some demonstrations. So, so how do you see the um, um, relation between that movement popping up in, in this specific situation or, or how, how are they, I mean, in, this is, uh, maybe going in both directions um, and how are both related to your, uh, in your opinion. Okay. At, at a certain level, the, the obvious answer that, that comes to my mind is that this is simple coincidence. Um, whilst COVID has uh, dominated our thoughts and our, both our personal and our public discourses so much over the course of the last few months, um, it is still not the only thing out there. And that's why I was kind of trying to highlight that the climate change agenda, which had been finally in 2019, Greta Thun the Greta Thunberg effect, had made people think more seriously about what we really mean by responding to climate change challenges. Um, uh, you know, that is still there, but we're just giving it less attention. Um, I think the Black Lives Matter uh, protests and the social movement around that um, is, uh, it's happening coincidentally rather than being connected in with this. Of course, the way in which the, the social movement can actually behave is now subject to a very unusual set of circumstances. So um, old fashioned methods of, we go out and have a mass march along a street. Mm, well, you're not really supposed to be doing that anymore. Um, so you have to try to find new means of, um, of how you go about pursuing a political agenda in this kind of way, finding a new technique um, uh, given the restrictions that do exist. Uh, and of course, it again, it also leads to the state being able to say, oh, we're, well, we're going to stop you protesting. It's for your own safety. And that's being used to some extent uh, in relation to the, the reaction against the Black Lives Movement's uh, uh, situation. Perhaps also you can see, as far as I know, I heard one or two comments that um, the protests in Belarus um, after the the election and the, the fantastic victory for President Lukashenko. Uh, um, that, you know, again, part of that was saying, oh, we're, well, we're not trying to stop people coming out in the streets. What we're trying to do is we're going to, uh, it's for safety. It's because of COVID-19, there shouldn't be these, these protests taking place. 
Um, okay, a very disingenuous way of approaching it. So people are trying to utilize COVID-19 in support of other agendas. But um, now, obviously, we then, then go into broader questions. There are areas where these two things start to parallel. And I think in particular, um, the whole way in which um, uh, the more, the new right, for them, this is yet another, uh, you know, the, the, the restrictions. This is an example of a, an overbearing government telling us what to do, that uh, social interests are damaging the economy and therefore, you know, this is going to be disastrous for us. Uh, and again, that we should ultimately, people have individual responsibilities, individual freedoms, that trumps, the sorry, I shouldn't be using Trump in this context maybe, uh, but uh, that um, uh, supersedes, shall we say, um, the collective, social dimension. So it's coming back to some very fundamental political issues about to what extent do you counterbalance the individual freedom with social rights and collective rights. Um, so for them, you know, the protests against wearing a mask are part of a wider protest about, well, we should have a right to carry a gun, we should have the right to do this, that and the other. Um, so to some extent they do dovetail, it becomes a new issue that they can pick up on and use it to demonstrate how we cannot trust governments. But I think in a lot of the other ones, and I think particularly the Black Lives uh, uh, Movement um, uh, situation, um, it, I think it's just pure coincidence that they happen to be taking place at the same time. Um, uh, and I, I hope that the COVID situation does not lead to the Black Lives Movement situation being less effective because it has to be more restrained in what it can do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that, for that view. I would like to... Um, okay, and I, want to, come I, I see two questions that are yeah. very similar uh, on the topic. It's related probably to the deglobalization uh, potential trend. Uh, yeah. Two students were wondering whether uh, the crisis will lead to a long-lasting reshoring of the production of certain resources, like, of course, uh, medical uh, material or... or uh, yeah, pharmaceutical uh, resources. Um, so a, a new type of, uh, yeah, re-industrialization maybe in certain countries, reshoring and maybe protectionism or two questions are going in this, uh, in this direction. Yeah, uh, a really interesting question and, and it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, um, again, uh, President Macron here was saying, oh, maybe we have offshored production too much, particularly in these kinds of areas and we need to think about bringing it back uh, to uh, the country, there's into France. Um, uh, I think there's a logic to that, um, um, but also it depends not just on what political leaders might say. And again, I think we have to recognize political leaders are, they're, they're, they're not all powerful by any means. They, they are dependent on so much else of what is going on around them. And I think in particular, that idea of restructuring of production, well, I do hope that the, the boards of directors of the huge big pharmaceutical companies who are going to be making these decisions will recognize the value of sourcing things in, in a more fragmented way to allow populations better access, as opposed to saying, what's the bottom line? If we ship it out to this particular country, do we get more tax breaks? Is it a, uh, are there lower trade union regulations? Is it a cheaper workforce? And that's the only thing that they were, they're worrying about. So they need to be making intelligent political decisions in the broadest sense of what political is about. Um, when, when they are thinking about how they are running their companies and how, how, what their companies are trying to achieve. As I say, to my mind, one of the things that comes out of this very strongly is that there is a broader responsibility that all of us share as citizens. And I think economic leaders, Leaders, you know, people running companies and corporations and so on, need to be responsible, respond, need to be aware of and responsive to those broader political and social impacts of what they do um, and of what they're what they are trying to achieve. Um, so I, I, I would I would suggest it creates an opportunity for restructuring of production. To my mind, that makes a lot of sense. Whether that would be what actually happens is another matter entirely. And that's not in politicians' hands to any really strong extent. Okay. I um, see um, more questions coming in um, that um, bring up the topic of 
individual freedoms of the tension between individual freedoms and um, uh, repressive or, or restrictive measures in, in which aim to um, contain the, the virus. So the, the tension between um, well, um, um, state restriction and precaution and, and stuff um, on the one hand and, and individual freedoms, freedoms on, the another, uh, on the other. And that can be maybe also um, combined with um, another question that is about um, the, uh, the risk of um, 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 extra, the rise of extremism. Um, um, so so um, um, yeah, um, which can also be seen as an outcome of politics at the moment. So how do you see that field? Um, freedoms and restrictions and um, the, uh, the, the consequences that this can have. Yeah, okay. Um, I think at a kind of a philosophical level, that whole question of, in, of individual freedom, um, anyone looking at that would say straight away, uh, well, sorry, not anyone necessarily. I think a lot of people who look at that will say individual freedom is a good thing, but that does not mean unlimited freedom. Clearly, I don't have, I like individual freedoms um, uh, in terms of how I behave and what I try to do. Uh, that does not mean that I have the right to say, oh, shouldn't I have a gun? And if I decide to shoot somebody, well, that's an individual freedom. Clearly, that's not because your individual freedom is suddenly very seriously impacting on somebody else's individual freedom. So we've got to recognize that even in the concept of individual freedom, there is a social responsibility as to what we can or cannot do. And generally kind of liberalism has tried to say what we need to do is to create the maximum level of individual freedom without inhibiting collective uh, context in terms of what we can achieve and what we can try to do. So there is, there is a challenge there about, about, what, about what we do, how we respond. And again, that's why I think the collective response that we've, the, the, the cooperative response that we see from populations in so many countries about how they have said, yeah, we understand the need to be more restrictive about what we're doing at the moment because this is an emergency situation. We understand the fantastic work that's been done by the health staff and the other um, frontline workers, so to speak. Um, you know, again, people going out and collecting our bins and that kind of stuff. The delivery cyclists with, um, uh, even if they're a, a massive danger, you know, I always kind of feel I'm going to get run down by the delivery cyclists as, I, as I'm walking through Vieux-Lille uh, in the evening. Um, but, you know, I think for the most part, people, you know, there's an intrinsic awareness of the kind of balances we need. Yes, we want individual freedom, but we need the social dimensions to this as well. So I think a, a minority of people taking a more extreme view, and this gets me onto the extremism bit, um, uh, again, it's just something we need to keep an eye on uh, in terms of how we balance this. Yeah, I didn't say an awful lot about another regular political feature of the last, let's say, 10, 15 years, the rise of populism, if we take that as, as a version of extremism, and I don't automatically, I don't want to automatically associate populism with extremism. I think you can have centrist populism um, in a certain type of a way. Um, so I don't think the two are absolute synonyms uh, in terms of how we can treat them. Um, I think, again, if I was to, very quick, I didn't really think about this. If I'm thinking about it now off the cuff, my immediate reaction would be, here's another group that have had a not very good crisis. So the Greens have come out of this sort of, they've lost the, the, the momentum that had built up last year with the, the whole Greta Thunberg and the school strikes and so on, uh, and the push they were starting to develop there. I think, again, sort of um, the kinds of reactions from uh, the populist parties in a, in a lot of situations. My instinct would be, again, the kinds of things they've been arguing for, th because it's fairly evident that cooperation is one of the best ways of trying to react to um, this international health crisis, and international cooperation is the way to try and do with it. That isn't very good for the kind of, if you like, the populist nationalist extremist argument. So again, they've not had a good crisis. Um, and I say that one more positively as somebody who doesn't identify with or associate uh, those types of movements. Again, they can always recover, but that's how I'd, I would respond initially to trying to think about that. Okay, thank you, Michael, for that answer. We are um, already a bit over time at this uh, half past three. Do, do we want to do any last verge conclusions? Orian, do you, do you still want to... Um, uh, make uh, one or the other point um, to conclude, or even Michael, 
um, um, so that we can wrap this uh, conference up. Okay. Ah, I don't know why you are not able to. Okay, now now I can speak. Yourself. I was okay. muted. Um, no, well, I hope it's not going to be the conclusion because it's not really uh, optimistic and it's just a, a direct reaction to what Michael just said about uh, far-right uh, parties in, in, in certain um, uh, prediction. You can also say that uh, the crisis, the economic crisis now that will be uh, a lasting uh, um, impact effect of the of the corona crisis will potentially benefit more to to far right and and populist uh, parties um that we will they will have this uh, it can also go in their direction in terms of promoting more nationalism because we see what uh, international cooperation brings that it's uh, it's not efficient and uh, so i don't know um uh, yeah, what do you think of this more pessimistic uh, conclusion or prediction, let's say, um, after the crisis? Um, I said it already, I, was, I went for a positive conclusion and a positive prediction. Um, of course, I could come up with the more, the more uh, disheartening ways of thinking about this as well. Uh, I'm not going to finish on a negative and critical note. So. Um, uh, yeah, of course, as with anything political, there's a political tussle out there. Um, and it's up to, if I can use a kind of a very broad and very imprecise word, having started with definitions, it's up to progressives to seize this moment, whatever way they might be progressive, you know, green progressivism or whatever, as I would see it. Um, that, that is very important. Um, so I hope that is the outcome. Um, and uh, if we are being allowed a little opportunity for final comments, can I, do, can I just say um, uh, uh, to thank the participants? I'm sure, Sabine, I'm sure you're going to be doing this as well. This is actually, for me, um, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, and I, I'm looking at the numbers of people participating and the numbers of questions coming in and saying, wow, okay. And again, I'll, I'll repeat what I said. I'm very happy if people want to email me to try to continue. Uh, a discussion about this. Uh, uh, bearing in mind, uh, I'm still trying to find a flat. I'm still trying to um, uh, get my, my lecture notes for tomorrow's class, all of this kind of stuff sorted out. So will I be responding immediately? Maybe not, but I'm very happy to respond. Good. Thank you, Michael. So let, then let me thank you. This was really a great talk, a great uh, first conference in our semester program. We are happy to have you in Lille now as a, a, a colleague, a, a member of um, uh, the faculty at ESPOL. So thank you for this great talk um, and all the thoughts and, and uh, aspects that you um, shared with us. Thanks also to Oriane Cardigaro um, and thank you very much to all um, of you who have been listening, who are still here and um, sorry about the technical problems that we had. That's life, uh, but I still, we, uh, still think we, we got something out of that that is um, uh, very interesting. So um, yeah, goodbye. Um, see you in the next conference in October. Um, sorry, Michael, you want to? Well, can I just add in one very specific thank? Well, to say thank you to Aurélien, but again, particularly thank you, Axel, working in the background there somewhere. Yeah. So great work. <laughs> good. That's all uh, about teamwork. Okay, let's leave it here. Have a good day, and see you on the next um, occasion at the next conference. Bye bye. Thanks. <laughs>